Good afternoon, evening, morning, good night, uh, where, depending on where you are, everyone. My name is Mark Sargent. Uh, I'm EC Science Program Manager, and this is to welcome you to today's Game Changer Seminar, for which we have Joe Silk. Uh, welcome, Joe. And uh, yeah, uh, let me introduce Joe Silk to begin with. Joe is a scientist of many achievements and many affiliations as well. So let's start with that. <laughs> uh, Joe is currently for this talk in the in the US where he has a, a position at Johns Hopkins in, in Baltimore, but he also has researcher or professorial appointments at uh, IAP and CEA in Paris and at the University of Oxford. Uh, Joe is fellow of the Royal Astronomical Society, Royal Society, I beg your pardon. Um, Fellow of the National Academy of Sciences and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. And uh, yeah, um, in his long and distinguished career, uh, John Joe has worked on many topics. Um, one of them, I'm sure, is going to appear prominently in today's talk uh, on telescopes on the moon, the early universe, um, for which uh, Joe also received the um, Balzan Foundation Prize in 2011 on his work on the early universe. So yeah, uh, Joe, uh, we're very much looking forward to your talk. Um, I'm sure you will touch on quite a few topics reflecting all the work you have done. Uh, so the stage is yours. Um, for the audience, uh, you can post questions in the chat during Joe's talk if you would like. Uh, we will get to those after Joe has completed his presentation, or you can also simply raise your hand after the presentation and Vili, our system administrator, will unmute you behind the scenes and you can ask Joe your question directly. But yeah, uh, first, Joe, uh, please take it away. We're looking forward to what you have to tell us. Thank you, Mark, for that very nice introduction. So um, today I'm going to give you a very futuristic view of where we'll be going in cosmology and even in astronomy in the next, um, I would have said decades, but probably it'll be several decades. Anyway, it's a long-term view, but it's I think it's inevitable. So I'm going to be speaking about the current acceleration in putting projects on the moon and how we can take advantage of that as astrophysicists and astronomers and cosmologists. Okay, um, let me go back to the beginning of modern cosmology. And so it's all rather remarkable that the foundations of our current field in which the universe is dominated by um, dark energy, et cetera, were for, was for, so foreseen a long time ago by Georges Lemaitre, who was the founder of physical cosmology. Here you see a sketch from his notebooks in which, in, in which he depicts the various possibilities for expanding universes, including those dominated by the cosmical constant, um, which can expand forever and begin to accelerate actually as they ex expand at, at, after some in this after some billions of years. And he even realized that what was important in his depiction of the universe was negative energy, the vacuum energy, which um, um, whose fluctuations give you uh, an important ingredient of cosmology and lead to that acceleration. And what we've learned since then, and there's only been really one major advance in cosmology that's come from inflation around half a century or so after, after Lemaitre, in which uh, I show you the pioneers here, they had a really nice interpretation of the initial conditions of the beginning of the universe, still very far from complete, big questions remain, as I'll now mention, but this was really the first major advance um, since Lemaitre's pioneering theory. And I think it's fair to say that this is really the current status of cosmology, how we can explain the present size of the universe and the fluctuations therein by this, um, mysterious beginning, um, which was a natural consequence of, um, of, of the very early universe when a new field was introduced that gave this uh, inflation. So let's talk about the history of figure that many of you have seen um, in which uh, the present day universe full of galaxies 
We've done a great job in looking backwards in our computers, as well as with the new newest telescopes such as Webb, to redshifts of 10 or more, that is when the universe was a 10th of its present size. Uh, and we're exploring the first galaxies, the first massive black holes and active galactic nuclei. But before then, um, there was nothing. There were the first galaxies somewhere around, you know, redshift 20, we, we, we suspect. But for then, there were the cosmic dark ages. And that really is virgin territory. We need to explore that far more. It's the new frontier, actually, um, for our next generation of telescopes, as I'll sh shortly explain. And then before that, um, some 370,000 years after the Big Bang, was the last scattering of the microwave background. Before then, the universe was um, impenetrable, except, except for studying the black body spectrum of the cosmic microwave background, as I'll mention in a moment. That's a unique probe that takes us back even earlier to the first months. And then before that, there is inflation. Um, and we have, it's a wonderful theory, explains fundamental aspects of the present universe, especially its size. But the key question we have there is how did the universe really begin? Um, we believe that inflation began around 10 to the minus 36 seconds after the beginning. And um, it continued briefly and to reach its present size actually. And then the, the observable part of the universe expanded at its normal sedate rate. Uh, limited by the speed of light, and uh, we pass through this mysterious phase of the Dark Ages, which is a big puzzle. Um, and that's what I'll tell you about. And also, one of the consequences of the modern theory of cosmology has been that we have missing ingredients that we don't understand very well. What is the dark matter? That's one of the big questions. And what about the Hubble constant? Different techniques for measuring it. Uh, show some tension. We don't know what's behind that. And I'm going to also mention in passing another topic, which is, I think, one of the big questions. You can say inflation, what is the beginning? Our origin is one of the biggest questions. Another, one's, another one is, um, are there exoplanets, twins of the Earth, on which there may be life? Big, big question. And I'll show you how the moon is a unique way forward in all of these issues. That's the purpose of my talk, to try to enthuse you about answering the greatest questions with the moon. Well, let's begin um, with um, the current status of cosmology. And I would say we have some wonderful experiments. I'll mention these briefly as we go along. Um, one of them is trying to zero in on the dark energy. And you can see that if I had tried to reproduce a similar plot shortly after Lemaitre's time, the error bars would have filled this entire diagram. Um, uh, and they've gotten smaller and smaller. But the amazing thing is that with the latest data, they're all converging on Lemaitre's cosmological constant value. Um, uh, that is an equation of state of you know the dark energy I showed you in a Lemaitre slide of P equals negative pressure, P equals minus rho c squared. So where could we go? Well, we want to do more and more precise experiments. You see some of them listed over here, um, both in space and on the ground. Um, will they give us some deviations that we would be where the new physics lies? We have no idea. The microwave background, another immense area of incredible progress by studying the fluctuations going from, you know, degree Kelvin at the time of Penzias and Wilson, now down to micro Kelvin. We'll have to push it even further to see traces of um, inflation, which are measured by the, the, the shear of the fluctuations. That's this um, left hand, the, the ordinate of this curve R against the plot against the spectral index. The problem is that we're looking for predictions of what this um, uh, measure of inflation might be, this shearing, this polarization of the primordial uh, parts of the microwave background radiation fluctuations. We're looking for that, and the promise theory gives no 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 firm uh, value. Uh, it could be very low. In fact, most of the inflation models give you an observably low low value. So there's no guarantee of success there either. 
Finally, dark matter, um, we have this enormous parameter range, many orders of magnitude between the particle interaction strength and the particle mass. We've just probed a tiny fraction of it. We'll be increasing that. We're inventing many ways to look for very ultralight particles on the left here, as well as the standard ones um, that we study mostly today. And so far, no indications of success anywhere. Um, and just to um, emphasize that there is just no guaranteed return. And in, in finishing this topic, I, I can also mention that particle physics at very high energies, accelerators. You can hope enormous energy, maybe you have to go to 100 TV, uh, something like that in your accelerator for banging protons together uh, to look for indications of new particles that might be dark matter. There's no guarantee of success. And likewise, the, the culprit may be that you simply modify um, gravity. Again, there's an enormous parameter space where gravity could be modified. We've only explored the tiniest part of that, that's this red circle. And again, no guaranteed return from any of these experiments. So the question is, where are we going in cosmology? Can we ever do better? And the answer is, um, if you have compelling science, yes, I think you can. And that will mean going to the moon. Okay, to begin this story then of going to the moon, let me tell you first about, you know, a major new frontier in, in cosmology probably the most important direction that we'll be going in next. That is now we're pretty much seeing the early galaxies, the early black holes with the James Webb telescope. We want to go much further back. How did it all begin? And that means looking at the building blocks, the hydrogen clouds that made up these, uh, these are the first galaxies, all galaxies initially. And how can we see them? Well, let me show you a cartoon first. Um, and this indicates the incredible power of what we can do. Um, here you see the mass of a typical galaxy, but it formed from many, many small building blocks in our standard theory of structural formation. Uh, and you can estimate the masses of the smallest building blocks. There were millions of solar masses. So there are millions of these building blocks for every galaxy, which means in all you have trillions of these clouds there in the very early universe before they merged and formed into galaxies and stars, whatever. And that gives you enormous statistical power because you only have in the galaxy field, in the biggest surveys, billions of galaxies, and those have to, a bit complicated. So maybe you have a hundred million independent points of information. And if you look at the CMB, you have a million pictures on the sky. That's it with our current experiments and any, and any future experiments because of the damping of the fluctuations on small scales. So you're very limited, but the beauty of hydrogen is that you can see it soon after the last scattering of the radiation, um, the matter begins to move on a slight different adiabat from the radiation uh, because of its equation of state basically. And it, it's cooler and you can see it as a shadow against the macro background. And later on, you get all sorts of mess from astrophysical sources in the sky, uh, which give you different effects on the spin temperature, because you do this at 29 centimeters, but there's a beautiful signal where this red star is indicated. And that, you want to see that, you want to detect that shadow against the microwave background, and eventually, after you detect that shadow, um, you can then begin to think about looking for fluctuations in the shadow. It's much the same story as we did originally with microwave background. Remember, we first found the global signal, then we look for the fluctuations, and that's gotten us into immense richness of cosmology. It'll be the same story for the dark ages, except that we haven't begun. We haven't seen this global shadow yet, but we will. And the reason we're so optimistic that we can do this, as you can see in this figure that compares the microwave background the power of that in doing cosmology, large scale structure, and finally 21 centimeter, you can basically, as you pick up these different measures, you have more and more power in the numbers of independent pixels, if you like, in the numbers of bits of information. And that means um, you can go down to um, uh, regions where you have many, many modes on the sky. And that means you can do precision cosmology, thanks to these uh, building blocks. 
But the question then is, how do you unlock this? I just want you to no notice as we as we go along that, that we're looking for millikelvin, hundreds of millikelvin signals. That's small, that's really small, as I'll show you next, uh, but we can do that. But you can only do this if you go somewhere outside the earth. And this simply shows you the problem that we have, that the, um, the transmission from, thanks to the atmosphere, is basically only possible at high-ish high radio frequencies. If you want to do highly redshifted uh, 21 centimeter, and, and look at this, we're looking at redshifts of 50 or something, that's roughly the sweet spot. If you want to do that, that means you have to look at wavelengths of 10 meters, frequencies of 50 megahertz or below, and you simply have to go outside the atmosphere. You just get nothing over here. Okay, that is the problem. Space or the moon is the only solution. And for various reasons, I will argue next that the moon is the only realistic solution. Space is far too complicated to have enormous numbers of radio telescopes and interferometers to actually do this. It, the, the moon with its stable platform and um, no atmosphere is the place to go. So let me just review for you the goal here um, and why this is so exciting is that essentially all inflation models uh, give you a signal of non-Gaussianity, incredibly weak, but there is a lower bound. Unlike the beautiful things we'll be doing by searching for polarization of the CMB signal for fluctuations, there's no guarantee we'll ever find one. But here there is a guarantee of looking for this tiny non-Gaussianity effect characterized by this parameter here, FNL, and the minimum value is of order of order 0.01, okay, given factors of a few, predicted by essentially all models of inflation. Can you ever get there? Well, using this simple parameterization of, of non-linearity, of non-Gaussianity, um, you can argue that you just need a huge number of bits of information on the sky. Micro background gives you a million. Um, that already has set limits of order 10 on this, on this parameter of non-Gaussianity. Galaxies will do much better, but it will give us numbers of order unity. The only way to get down to this magic guaranteed prediction is with the hydrogen clouds. You have trillions of them, very, very hard to do. Back to the dark ages, the beginning of the dark ages, look for the shadow, that's the way to go. Okay, so the far side of the moon is the ultimate place to go. Why? Uh, because why the far side where well, you don't want the Earth to be in your sky? The Earth is a messy place. It's full of cell phones and television and marine radars, all sorts of things. And that will give you problems in getting on the moon and getting down to these low frequencies. Doing it on the Earth is no good at all, of course, because of the ionosphere. The moon has no ionosphere. You should be very safe there. And so what you want to do to get this magic redshift of order 50 is you work at a wavelength of 10 meters to get the highly redshifted hydrogen line from the spin flip of, of uh, electrons around hydrogen atoms. Um, guaranteed signal, we map the entire galaxy with that, the universe even, but we want to see at these low frequencies, the highly redshifted analog. You need resolutions of order, you know, 100 times that you get in the, in the microwave background. That's quite feasible if you have a large enough array. Um, and the sort of array we're talking about is of order 100 kilometers. That'll do the job very nicely to get this sort of resolution. To get the sensitivity is a whole other story. You need, you need dipoles, first of all, simple dipoles, the simplest possible, you know, antennae of order meet many meters to do this. But you need millions of them. But that's okay. Uh, you can put them together on the lunar surface and, and look for this wonderful shadow. Okay, so the moon is the place to go. Here is the biggest problem we'll have. There's a lot of background radiation in the universe, foreground, I suppose, against the, against the, the shadow we're looking for. And that synchrotron radiation, mostly from resolved and unresolved distant objects and in, in diffuse gas, whatever, with the high energy particles, is up to thousands of Kelvin, most likely. And we're looking for a 100 or 10 millikelvin signal. You may say that's totally impossible, but think of the microwave background. We went from three degrees Kelvin, um, maybe a 10th of that in the first experiments, fractions of a degree Kelvin, now to micro Kelvin. 
and we're planning to go to nano Kelvin in the not so distant future, thanks to our new experiments, CMBS4, et cetera, and, uh, and uh, Lightbird, et cetera, other experiments like that. So we can do it with a micro background. Why can't we do it also with the, with the 21 centimeter signal? I don't see why not. Um, and if you can do that, you can actually get a test of inflation. And that'll be testing it via looking for this primordial non-Gaussian signal, which is a guaranteed signal. And it's the ultimate in precision cosmology. And this sort of shows you the general picture you have, the beginning, uh, the last scattering surface, here we are, and the dark ages, that's you where, where you want to probe. You just don't, to see these non-Gaussian signals depicted in a cartoon fashion here, uh, as higher order correlation functions, you need, to go to this area where there is the power in principle of getting to this low level in principle. So how do you actually do this in practice? Okay, well, it's not a big mystery. We're building the uh, low frequency version of the square kilometer array that doesn't quite go down to low enough frequencies because of the Earth's ionosphere, et cetera, which is a shield that stops us seeing below to 30 megahertz and below where the mystery signal is. But we do this, we know how, lots and lots of dipoles or tripoles, maybe even more than 100,000 are planned. And there's no reason why you can't do much more, but that's from the Earth. So we know the technology, what, let's do it on the moon. Okay, so there are all sorts of ideas now around, um, futuristic, these are design studies only, uh, but they're beginning to be approved. Here is your the loader that you will take to the moon uh, with the material in to, um, uh, either fabricate on the spot or just lay out the, the equipment you need, the antenna you need, this ESA program. Um, it's a bit like Amazon delivery to the moon in a way. Um, one and a half tons of payload is forecast around 2030. This will begin um, uh, well into the Artemis era, which I'll come to later. Um, ESA is um, also planning another um, observatory on the moon with many, many antennae um, spread out over uh, a kilometer, a square kilometer or thereabouts, this will have, you know, 10,000, um, 1,000 or 10,000 um, elements, not quite as many as you need to the ultimate experiment. It's well on the way there. And this would be a pathfinder to a, an even bigger experiment, no doubt, once once this is done. And this can be done with a single uh, uh, argonaut lander in principle. Um, and then you'd need several to go to the next step. Well, earlier than that, um, and NASA is busy designing, uh, uh, if you like, a Pathfinder experiment with 128 antennae um, rolled out on the moon with this um, uh, rover uh, laying out the antennae and the nodes. And much more ambitiously, um, uh, there's, a, there's an, also a design to have 100,000 antennae and this of spread over 20 kilometers. And this would involve fabrication on the moon. And again, this is something we're thinking of maybe in two decades time or whatever, but you have all the, all the right raw materials there to do this, uh, to build this and assemble this thing robotically. I, I, I think that's the way it would go. I'll come back at the end to what's happening in the next year or two, amazing things too. Um, but let me just finally mention this futuristic study by saying uh, these, this is, I've shown you NASA, so I've shown you um, ESA, and now um, the Chinese Space Agency um, is planning also a, an ambitious um, program on the moon with 270 dipoles on the far side, again, in the next decade or so, early 2030s. And so it's an interesting competition to see who gets there first and builds up to larger things. But that's a wonderful thing. Here's another uh, dramatic design, I find, um, which is uh, having an Arecibo type telescope. And then why do you need this large antenna? Uh, well, you have to really kill off all those foreground sources somehow. And this is ideal for doing that, for getting a, a clean sky to look for your mysterious signal. And it, it's a beautiful idea. It's Arecibo on the moon, but it's fast on the moon give you a receiver's replacement. And that is you have um, a, a gigantic um, uh, uh, parabolic type um, receiver made, just made from deployable wire mesh because you don't need high resolution with the, the focal plane suspended from the crater rims. And this is designed to give you, you know, 30, mega, 30 megahertz um, what you want. It's got to go on the far side again to observe the noise um, from the earth, which would, uh, whose side lobes, et cetera. Would, would be a disaster if you wanted the near side. 
Okay, so that's for the moment what I want to tell you about the Dark Ages, which is the new frontier of cosmology, in my opinion, beyond the first galaxies. Let me tell you another great challenge in cosmology, the cosmic black body radiation. We've made immense progress here now with our study of um, the fluctuations and the polarization. It's, it's a wonderful thing. But the one thing that we have not advanced on is the spectrum of the cosmic black body radiation. We're really um, stuck with a perfect black body from initially from the fire as Kobe experiment. So what is missing? So what is missing is the following. There are standard structure formation model, bottom up formation, fundamental theory of dark matter, Lambda cosmology uh, tells us that uh, it must leave a trace in the spectrum of the radiation. Because if I have all these tinier fluctuations, subgalactic scale, the building blocks, um, their um, baryonic precursors would inevitably exert friction against the microwave background and give you a heating signal. And so here is where you want to look. In this um, uh, cartoon, we have all the information from microwave background and all the galaxies on galactic scales um, and on cluster scales. Uh, but way down here is the small scale roots of our present cosmology. We haven't, we need a test of that. That's a basic element of lambda CDM cosmology. What do we do to get that? We have to look for this friction effect. Um, so here is this incredibly perfect black body, untouched really since the fire as Kobe experiment. Incredible perfection. Um, it's a hundred sigma curve, 400 sigma curve you're looking at here um, to uh, uh, parts in 10,000 in terms of deviations from a black body. But there are predictions, um, deviations from, uh, which you can express in terms of two parameters, Y, which is the late distortion. And I wanna focus on mu, which is the early distortion, which happens in the early phase of the universe. And this is because you're injecting some energy into the background radiation and first pre pre predicted by um, Senor Evan Zeldovich. And it leads to energy injection that is incompletely thermalized. So energy injection here, it occurs at lower frequencies and you basically Compton scatter it up um, into higher frequency, you get a distortion. Now, all this only happens after about a month because in the, in the first month and before, you have sufficiently high density that you have effects like um, double Compton scattering, which can create new photons. But when you, after a month, and Bremsstrahl into an after a month, you're only in the, in, in, in the scattering regime, you don't change energy. Um, so basically you just transfer energy. And so because you conserve energy, you basically distort the spectrum. And that's what we want to measure and set some limit on. And so here you see the limits from Kobe fire us, parts in 10,000 of order. We have to do much, much better. And maybe we have to do a thousand times better. So how do you do this? Well, you go to a dark crater. You're gonna need a very cold experiment, okay? Um, and so going to say this crater, an example, four kilometers deep, 21 kilometers wide, great place to put telescopes. I'll mention that again later. Always dark um, because the rims are so high and very, and the sun never gets high above the horizon. It's near the poles of the moon, near the South Pole in this case. And it's all, you know, it's cold. It's been measured to be, you know, of order 30 Kelvin in many places here. And what you want to install there, if you want to do this on the moon, you could also in space, it's not impossible, is have a Fourier transformative barometer, which would basically compare the sky with a cold black body reference. And you don't even to have a, you have a telescope attached, of course, um, but you don't need to organize its motion. It, you can let the sky be scanned by lunar rotation. You have to cool it down to two and a half Kelvin degrees and you have power nearby. You have to have to get from the rims which are permanently sunlit and have a tower there maybe and send power down somehow. So it, it seems to be not an impossible thing um, to do. It was proposed by the ESA Voyager 2050, uh, Voyage 2050 program. It's one of their, this sort of thing is one of their key aims, either in space or possibly on the moon. That's not specified. We have a lot of time to think about that to 2050. Okay, so how then do we do this? Um, well, Kobe left us with this number for this spectral distortion, 
from after the first month of the universe, taking us well back before the 400,000 years we see from the fluctuations of the Big Bang, incredible step backwards in time to the beginning. But the main experiment, the Fourier interferometer, was rejected twice, actually. Uh, I think, you know, a number of reasons, but it was only a 55 centimeter telescope and didn't really have the power to get down to testing the fundamental predictions of the theory. So right now we have the ESA program, which you know has this as a as a, a proposed mission. Unfortunately, we'll have to wait a very long time as there are major planetary experiments in line before this um, for Voyager 2050, and there's 10 years between each of these large scale missions. But in principle, it should be there on the list as a as a highly rated mission in the in the final report to get down to the desired level. And this is the expectation of what we'll do. So here you see um, uh, the uh, prediction, the predictions. These are the foregrounds. This is the messy part from dust, et cetera, et cetera, mostly from dust. And, um, uh, and so this is what you really want to do. And so this was the fire ass upper limits over here. And you can see they were just touching the foregrounds. But what you want to do is get down all the way um, to the this green line. Um, uh, these red and blue lines are the wide distortions, not so interesting, very fascinating to get this relative correction to that, very hot gas in this, et cetera. But what we want to look at is this, it's in quadrature, so you see the increase in the deficit relative to the black body at, uh, in the wean tail. And um, this is the level you need. Pixie didn't quite make it, but um, this is where we'll be um, with uh, the Voyage, uh, Voyage 2050 proposal. And that's why it's such an exciting proposal to think of this. Possibly uh, the best place might well be the moon. And I'll give you a reason for that in, in, in a moment too, why the moon might be have a side advantage over doing this as a free flyer. Um, and the ultimate goal would be this gold line here, uh, which you could begin to get with a future experiment. And why is that the ultimate goal? Those are the recombination lines from recombination of the universe back at redshift 1000. I mean, if you could possibly imagine this, getting the hydrogen lines and helium recommendation, getting the hydrogen helium ratio from pristine gas, but these lines are fundamental bread and butter physics in the nearby universe. Testing this at redshift 1000 to 10,000 is incredible. It's a way of proving local physics, fundamental physics operates back then. To me, this is the greatest goal of all, but it's a remote goal. It's gonna be very hard. And so why not do this on the moon? Well, I'll make that case more strongly in a moment. But let's just summarize where I've taken you so far. So th this is the power spectrum of fluctuations, current limits where we are now. The Planck satellite delves very deeply into this, uh, but only on the very largest scales, basically galaxy cluster-like scales. We have these microwave distortion and other limits, primordial black holes, whatever, evaporating, but they take us down in the um, in the in the power spectrum limit. The square root of this is roughly the fluctuations of the universe, and ten to the minus four is the standard level of primordial fluctuations at, at recombination. So here we haven't we're all just mentioned away from doing anything interesting. But if you take seriously what I've been advertising so far, twenty one centimeters gets us down to this intermediate range, the seeds of the dwarf galaxies, the building blocks, actually, the hydrogen clouds in, in shadow. And if we can tackle the spectral distortion with spectral distortion of the microwave background, then we can get to the first, after the first month of the universe, getting us back even further. So finally, we will have filled in a history of fluctuations in the universe uh, the whole basis of the uh, standard model is cosmology. Going from here, you have beautiful constraints from galaxies and CMB, adding the dark ages, adding the spectral distortions, we'll have a coherent picture of the roots of, of the basis of our current cosmology. So I find that very exciting. Okay, um, now I'm going to take you on a brief tour of what else we can do, we will do certainly uh, with cosmology on the moon. Okay, and building special telescopes. So first of all, gravity waves. Okay, why is the moon an obvious place to do this? Well, there's a long story behind it, but it sort of begins with the moon being a giant bar detector. Okay, I mean, so that gives you fundamental vibrations, right? 
And then in addition, it's a great place, given the lack of air, et cetera, to build a laser interferometer. And because of the incredible conditions, you can bounce these um, laser beams and have a large baseline many times, and you can basically fill the gap in sensitivity between laser to be launched, 2035 or thereabouts, million, million mile separations of the three satellites that form this, to LIGO, LIGO and Virgo with basically four kilometer baselines and new generation ones at, um, at 40 kilometer baselines. But you can fill this entire gap in frequency space, um, attaining a new window on black hole merging because as the black holes merge together and give you a gravity wave signal, they come in more slowly and therefore you see them at lower frequency. So you can put the whole story together by looking in this, in this gap between our current uh, possibilities. And this is one of the, the key ways you might do this by doing something rather simple actually, and something we know how to do on, on, on the moon. Um, in um, craters, most likely that are cold and dark, you would use them to give you a, a nice clean environment, um, but it doesn't, you can be less specific than that even. Okay, um, now next, telescopes. Okay, or well, telescopes that are, bright, uh, are again, you know, the basis of all, of all, most of our astronomy really. And so they do operate on the moon. We have a brilliant example here from 2014. You may think the moon is a dusty place, you know, uh, full of that regolith stuff. Will it kill off the, you know, you never do a thing, but this, it's been measured by, by China, observing since 2014 and taking many images. So um, here are some of possible crater sites, in this case, near the South Pole. It's the prime of current searching on the moon for various reasons. I'll explain why in a moment, um, but you have any number of possible sites for dark, craters, permanently dark craters and very cold, great places to put our next generation of telescopes. Well, what would these telescopes do? And well, first you might want to go to the Shackland crater, I many, and there are others, that, it, and you have lots of ice on the moon in the craters discovered by Tra Chandria 1, uh, and its successor was launched successfully recently and had the first, um, had a soft landing on the moon. So that was, that's very exciting too. And you have all you need to basically help you uh, install telescopes and um, local resources from the ice if you need those. Um, certainly that would help with various things too. So what would you do with a telescope on the moon? Well, let me give you the first example, okay? Uh, it would be a great way to discover exoplanets. Now, right now, our dream, NASA's dream, our dream, is the Habitable Worlds Observatory. So this is the current recommendation. Uh, it's only gonna be a six and a half meter telescope. Something um, much larger would be financially impossible. Um, but the problem with this space telescope, and it has a huge coronagraph to basically precisely uh, enable you to block out the light from the star and examine the atmosphere for biological signatures. However, it's predicted to have with this size only 25 targets. Now, some people will tell you that life is guaranteed, you know, but other people will argue that it's incredibly rare. And, um, you know, the pioneer of that argument was Fermi with the Fermi paradox. Let's not go into that. But here we are. If you can be, build a large telescope, overwhelmingly large telescope, once considered for the Earth, but long since abandoned for various reasons, you can suddenly go from tens to thousands. Uh, and even if you're more ambitious, many thousands. Um, in principle, you could build one of these on the moon. It, what, it's not a, you know, the first thing we'll do on the moon, but there's no reason at all why once you can do local manufacturing, you say you'd have a huge telescope and greatly increase your chances of looking for signs of life. And, you know, but there's another aspect of, um, of this that's even more important, I would say, than just gathering up uh, larger numbers of target exoplanets. One is doing optical interferometry on the moon. Look, you have no atmosphere on the earth. We've made wonderful progress with optical interferometry. Um, it's got gained Nobel prizes, et cetera, exploring the orbits of the stars near our central black hole and 
you know, very rightly awarded Nobel Prizes for this amazing, amazing discovery. Um, and you have, of course, to, to combine beams from, in, the, in that case, four telescopes and um, uh, account for optical delays to combine the beams, et cetera. But it's been mastered, only we can do. But if we do it on the moon, we have a big advantage. On the Earth, you're limited by turbulence. The turbulence time scale is milliseconds. So you have many, many millisecond exposures. On the moon, no atmosphere, no turbulence. You could integrate for hours. It's an incredible advantage. The power of an eight meter telescope translates into the power of a few centimeter telescope on the moon. Now, you need many of them. You need a collecting area eventually to do this. But you know, it's the, I think the only way to go, we've long tried to do interferometry in space. Those projects have mostly been abandoned, but the moon is a great place to do it. It's a stable platform. It's um, the future way to go um, now. Um, I'll show you one very futuristic way to do this. I would say, first of all, we'd better get very small systems going on the moon to test this idea out. But, you know, our imagination goes on. And here is, to me, one of the most incredible um, uh, thoughts about doing something on the moon. You could build a hyper telescope. Now, how do you do this? You go to a large dark crater and you put maybe 50 or 100 five meter telescopes and you combine their beams and you suspend the focus uh, from, from the rims, right? So this is the idea. And in principle, just from the ratio of wavelength to diameter, you can get microsecond resolution, okay? In the optical, far better in the ultraviolet perhaps. There's no reason why not. But if you had that resolution, here is the artist's prediction of what you can see. Okay, um, this is the Trappist system, not that far away, um, attainable, and you would get Earth-like planets, you know, a number of them are orbiting, and you would be able to see surface features and uh, amazing things, okay, with this resolution. So resolving the nearest exoplanets, uh, I find an incredible goal, and that is, you know, we, we can dream about, but you'd start off by testing out small optical interferometers on the lunar surface, on in, in a dark crater. And then as you go to smaller wavelengths, it gets even better because, you know, the resolution is wavelength over telescope diameter, right? But now you can imagine doing X-ray interferometers with milli arc second resolution. Um, and so here is one um, futuristic design um, the, your X-ray detectors are over here, and you have to have various shieldings and things around. It's all the details are not, are not shown, but this is a way to do exquisite imaging. You could do um, astrometry and um, of X-ray sources, and you know, study study galact galactic nuclei in a way you could never do uh, from space, actually, or from current instruments in space, or even proposed ones. Actually, it gives you uh, a huge uh, advantage over what you could you know, complement to what we will be doing in space in the future with X-ray astronomy. Okay, um, now I'm going to turn, that's all I wanted to tell you about experiments. Now let me turn just to the politics of it all and the current picture. So in the past two years, there's been a huge renaissance in lunar science projects. And that uh, for the moment is, is mostly due to the NASA, NASA's commercial launch commercial launch project. And several of these are in astrophysics. Um, they're actually, I think the count is now three far side low frequency radio projects. Um, and there are many private companies willing to do this um, that can take payloads of order a ton to the moon. Um, this is, um, and I mentioned already that, you know, we, we're planning mass delivery of, uh, of ton type payloads or subsets of that in the 2030s. Uh, the big changer in this whole field has been that now large lunar payloads have become feasible in a way that they were not previously. We have um, uh, SLS, we have Glenn, New Glenn, we have um, uh, Starship, all projecting payloads in low Earth orbit of order 50 tons, about a quarter of that will get to the moon if you want to go there. 
uh, because of obviously the extra fuel you need. Um, but that's a significant improvement where we are now. And what is more, the cost is going down. Um, right now, um, if we have recyclable, and SLS is not, it's a billion dollars or half a billion per launch, but if we can go to the recyclable scenarios, then costs will decrease dramatically. That will aid things in terms of putting telescopes on the moon. Um, and so, yeah, just um, it's one of the main space exploration narratives of our time, according to a recent Nature editorial. Okay, so it's all happening now. So let me tell you finally what's happening in the next two years, by 2026. Um, it, both US, NASA, and China are launching projects for the moon. So here is the first uh, far side lander designed to do late radio astronomy, la landed in January 2019. Unfortunately, they were not shielded from local interference from their um, delivery uh, system. The new experiments have learned this lesson. Um, one of them uh, is uh, the US version. Um, this is again, a CLIPS mission designed to be launched in 20, end of 2025. Um, and it's also just a single dipole, incredibly careful, but can absorb in principle for many lunar nights um, from the far side and has a good hope of getting the global signal. Not to be outdone, China has a, an even more ambitious experiment, which again, planned for 2026, has eight uh, dipoles flying in flotilla on small satellites with a mothership around the moon, a couple of hour orbital time so they can send the data straight back to Earth. And they, they argue they can actually have an interferometer that with a range of base, uh, baselines that will essentially, um, you know, on, on a, a certain elliptical orbit, and that would be a great way also to search for the global signal. So that's where we are. Um, there are certain issues I want to summarize very, very briefly. We have the Outer Space Treaty. You'll recognize some of these faces. Um, in 1967, it discusses many things, you know, who gets which bit of the moon, the first one there, how to decide mineral, mineral, lights, mineral rights, criminal law on the moon, pollution, military activity, I could have added, enforcement. The one thing that's missing is enforcement, okay? Um, so all, all these grand words are written down, a hundred and odd countries signed up, but we really need to go back to this, have a modern treaty focus, uh, focus, focusing on the new epoch of the moon, because there are a limited number of sites of order tens or twenties that are smooth enough craters near the poles. You wanna be near the poles for the darkness and cold, um, and they want to be accessible. Uh, it's been estimated you have 10 or 20 possible sites. Okay, and how do you spread those around? I We don't know until we have a, a better treaty. Um, and we have, what we have to do finally is to avoid the Wild West. You know, we don't want that to happen now that China and the US are actively going to the moon, landing on the moon. Um, India is not that far behind. Russia will join in. Um, Etc. cetera, um, Japan to all planning. And even the smaller countries are sending small, pa small pa uh, payloads to the moon, small rovers. Even the United Emirates Republic and Israel have are doing that, failed so far, with crash landings, but we'll do that in the near future. Okay, um, is it too expensive? Final remarks. Um, NASA was wonderful in the early days of Apollo. The budget's gotten more, more realistic in current dollars since. We're now, but this is enough in the Artemis area with this sort of funding with other organizations joining in to do wonderful things on the moon. And what's happening now is this is the cost of launch. Um, this is LSS way up there, half a billion um, to get large payloads, but Starship promises to revolutionize that um, and um, maybe New Glenn as well in the not so distant future. So that, um, it's a whole new perspective on building telescopes on the moon. And I should say that while, you know, uh, these experiments are incredibly expensive, Artemis, you know, many billions, but if I take a few percent of that, that's all I need to build all the telescopes I've talked about. And you may say that's crazy, but we wouldn't have had the Hubble Space Telescope without something like this. That was a, a few percent of the cost of the International Space Station and the Space Shuttle, right? And, and all the telescopes we ever launched from 
from the space from from the space station. So it can be done if we have that same attitude to a few percent of our total infrastructure budget on the moon goes to science. That'll be a wonderful thing. And um, I, and so this uh, let me not dwell on this one. This is the future where we're going. Artemis, Artemis, Artemis. Actually, um, it's less clear on the the, the Chinese plans, but I, I'm sure that they're not so different, including a space station, etc. And going on, um, let me summarize where, where we are. It's compelling science. It's in a space-like environment on the moon, and we're going there. And I would say that the reason for doing this for us scientists is that we can answer these incredible questions. These are probably the two bi biggest questions in, in cosmology, in astrophysics, even in physics. What were our cosmic origins and are we alone in the universe? You have all the right ingredients you need to do that on the moon, uh, from low frequency radio, uh, far infrared, optical, gravity waves, x-rays. Uh, lots, of, lots of problems in doing all of this, but I think it's all the feasible. So now's the time to plan. What you want to plan now are Pathfinder missions, small telescopes to start with, to demonstrate feasibility and you know attack some of the problems. But that's what we should be actively planning now and um, opening up funding channels to do this. So with this piece of reality, let me stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Joe. Uh, since the name Shackleton came up, I guess, I'm tempted to say it'll take quite some endurance until we get to the fanciest of these experiments, but you've made a compelling case why that would be well worthwhile scientifically. So yeah, we have a mixture of scientific and engineering questions, unsurprisingly, after this presentation. <laughs> so I'll first, um, I'll, I'll take them um, in order in which they arrived. And yeah, we, we shouldn't spend too much time on these questions because uh, Joe does have other commitments afterwards. But just to remind you, uh, the audience, that you can still add short questions to the chat uh, if you would like. So let's get going with Louis, who asks, um, does the fact that we need the, to position this telescope on the far side of the moon mean that we will have difficulty controlling the telescope remotely, necessitating astronomers on site? And maybe I can append to that question another one which is related. So how to get the signals back, uh, both in times of maybe in terms of data rate uh, and uh, yeah, sort of the, the practicalities. Um, Joe, do you want to tell yeah, us so how much thinking has these, been done on that question? Yeah, so these issues have been explored. They're very good questions. So first you get the data back by having a satellite. Um, this was done for Chang'e 4, excuse my pronunciation, um, uh, which didn't give any si science data back, but in principle, that problem has been solved. The satellite simply collects the data on the far side, and then two hours later, sends it back to Earth on the, on the near side. So that um, seems to work. The location is an issue. We've managed to make the Earth not radio quiet, of course, at these low frequencies, but the issue really is the ionosphere on the Earth. We don't have that on the moon, so it's a huge advantage. We could come to some agreement about frequency channels when I'm sure there'll be many small satellites going, commercial ones go, going around the moon, They're giving us the same problem we have on the Earth now, actually, with, with uh, mini satellites and interference. Um, all of that can be negotiated in principle, so I would not worry too much about radio spillover. Optical is another issue, but we'd have I'm sure we could control that too by, um, we're so far in advance um, for our optical telescopes on the moon that um, there's an, if we can ever get together and discuss this sensibly, let's say in the context of the United Nations, then I'm sure we could reach conclusions. And that I think for many reasons we have to do. Joe, may I just follow up on that? I mean, you, you sketched the scenario of an interferometer for the dark age hydrogen clouds. Um, now, interferometry leads to huge data volumes, right? And the SKA is going to be an example of this. Does the color correlator need to be on the moon for this? Or are you is, is the interferom interferometric data product going to be produced on Earth? Uh, what do you think? Yeah. So I, th I think there are designs uh, which have a correlator on the moon, others orbiting, you know, in space or 
you know, in, you know, and even a, the equivalent of a geostationary, lunar stationary, whatever the word is, um, satellite could could do that. So I, I think it's all um, un, in design stage. I think we're very, very far away from this large scale from what we're looking at now are the sm small ones, one element maybe, um, as in Lucy Knight. And that problem, you know, it's laid out by a rover. It's all highly automated. You don't need any people there. And uh, the signal goes to um, an, an orb orbiting satellite, which is sent up at the same time to, to relay the data. And so that can that, that can be done for, you know, the, the simplest experiments. When you go to interferometers, it's more complicated, but I don't, I don't think there's any obstacle, but you have to, you know, decide exactly where you want to do the correlating. And that I think is to be designed. Mm. Okay, so yeah, let's go on to Sonia's questions. Um, so first of all, she uh, mentions yeah, that among the experiments uh, happening soon, <laughs> uh, there's also the Pratush uh, mission from India for 21 centimeter cosmology. Um, it has already passed the, the concept phase apparently, so she just wanted to point that out. But she, she asks, and this is an interesting one, um, I guess about the longevity of such telescopes and being more exposed to radiation on the moon is 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 that an issue? Um, I don't think we really know, and that's why you want to send these pathfinders there. Um, certainly, the Chinese experiments experience from their optical, their small optical telescope is that longevity does not seem to be an issue. Radio should be even easier. Um, but I don't, I don't think we will know. As concerning the Indian experiment, it, it, what seems to be uh, uh, difficult there is that I think the decision made to go to low Earth orbit with that Pratush. And so that that's obviously an important test of feasibility, but I don't think that will deliver the science. You really have to go to orbit the moon, which is a great thing to do. And when that will happen, is, unfortunately, is you know, uh, uh, well, well after the Chinese uh, experiment that will do that. Yeah, so I guess yeah, a lot of these pathfinders will also uh, provide some more constraints on the statement that there is absolutely no ionosphere, because there have been some suggestions in the chat that literature has reported on very thin ionospheres um, and ionosphere features existing on, on the moon. So yeah, that, that's to be kept uh, in mind as well and, and, and followed, I guess, in, in the future. Um, I'd like to take two more questions um, before we close. Uh, so one is scientific. And I think since we have a general audience, uh, it is good uh, that we briefly address this. So Sabatino Sant'Angelo asks whether you could briefly elaborate on the importance of the non-Gaussianity concept. So um, what we're looking for is a robust test of inflation. Um, I, I think the current ones we have um, effort specifically on getting the primordial gravity wave mode, the tensor mode, which is a prediction of inflation, is not a robust test because um, the vast majority of inflation models occur at lowish reheating temperatures where you'd get such a low tensor signal that it would be unobservable. So the beauty of non-Gaussianity is that um, even though I might have been a bit optimistic in my FNL equals 1% argument, um, it is it is robust. Just about, it, you know, generic inflation models give you that with multiple, multiple fields, whatever. Um, so I, I think if you really want to test inflation, this is the main way you want to go. And it is going to need, unfortunately, uh, a very large number of antennas, about hundreds of thousands, radio in the front on the far side. So it's going to take a very long time. But, you know, why not? I mean, the great experiments do take a long time. Just just think of the LHC or something, you know, um, how many years of gestation that, that takes. For the next one, it'll be probably 50 years or more for a 100 TV collider. So we should be patient. <laughs> But I think that's that's going to be that's where we've got to go to really test inflation. Okay, so yeah, lots of comments of appreciation coming through the chat. Uh, compelling and visionary presentation, among others. So let's end on this interesting question. Um, 
yeah, commercial activities will pick up on the moon. And this uh, question addresses <laughs> that development. Uh, the question is, do you think mining on the lunar surface will affect the gravitational wave experiments? OK. Um... Mining is a whole issue. I think the worry there is pollution more than anything else. Um, and there's such commercial pressure now to do mining. You know, we're already, most of the current experiments are planned for the next 10 years are designed to survey the moon to prospect for, um, you know, the right mining sites by looking for, you know, signs of thorium, whatever, by low rate, low radioactivity. And so and eventually it's going to be, a, a, I'm sure, a huge industry on the moon looking for rare earths, et cetera, et cetera which are running out uh, on the earth. So, uh, but I think all of that can be contained. Um, there's no reason for them to do this on the dark side yet, at least. Um, so, and as for the dark craters, well, um, it's mining for water that is the problem there because one of the major interests of water, ice on the moon, is, you know, it's useful for making a local atmosphere, but especially for rocket fuel. And so there's going to be huge interest in uh, developing that. And there'll be a competition between uh, water mining and astron astronomical observatories. That's, that, that sort of is, is, is really the worry. But um, I think all of this with enough um, uh, communication and um, international treaties between the relevant uh, players in the game is the way to go forward. We've done this very well in the Antarctic where things have been under control. Of course, there are, the stakes are lower there, um, but uh, I don't see why this couldn't happen on the moon. It's got to happen, otherwise we'll have uh, all this competition unregulated and no way of enforcing it actually uh, yet that we can see. Yeah, and quite fitting that Antarctica is one of the places where a lot of these cosmology experiments are being carried out. Yeah, okay, um, we should end here. Um, thank you very much, uh, Joe. Um, thanks for everyone who joined online. Let's just look ahead to the end of next month, the end of November, when we'll have the next Game Changer seminar. Um, our invitee then, our speaker then, will be Andrew Ponson, speaking about uh, genetically modified galaxies. So we're looking forward to that. Thank you very much again, Joe. Have a nice evening, everyone, and see you next time. Yeah, thank you, everybody, for bearing with me. It's been great. <laughs>